In 1984, Data Age was one of the first video game companies from the golden age to file for bankruptcy. In many ways, they epitomized the North American video game crash of 1983 and 1984. While Data Age is credited with a couple of notable games like Frankenstein and Journey Escape, most of their output was shovelware. They clogged the channel with subpar games that no one asked for and few people wanted. The epitome of their output was Airlock, a game so bad it makes me angry to even think about. But was Airlock worse than the supposed worst game ever, E.T.? Well, today we will find out. Into the vertical line, generation Atari. Into the vertical line, generation Atari. E.T. the Extraterrestrial for the Atari 2600 might not be the best game ever made, but it has a cool title screen, and it offers a complete, albeit short, challenge to be completed. While there are some unfortunate choices, it's mostly bug-free. However, E.T. the Extraterrestrial has been called the worst game ever made, and we just don't believe it. We are here to collect evidence to see exactly where E.T. falls on the bad game spectrum. In this series, we will test other notorious games from the Golden Age and see how they stack up in comparison. This is Into the Vertical Blanks, Worse Than E.T., Airlock by Data Age. Here are the instructions for Airlock. Survival Basics. The object of Airlock is to retrieve the hatch keys and make your way to the next level before your compartment floods. But at the same time, you must avoid the torpedoes that have shaken loose and which, when they cross your path, rob you of precious time. Scoring. Instead of racking up points in this one, you are trying to beat the clock. You have 10 seconds to retrieve the keys to each level, make it to the elevator, and rise to the next level. Sound easy? Try it. When the red fire button on your joystick controller is pressed, your player will jump up, and the timer will start. You must now retrieve the hatch keys in the proper order, orange first, then white, and make your way to the elevator. Note, on each level, the elevator with an orange floor is on a different side, the side closest to the second key you retrieve. To retrieve a key, you must move your player directly underneath the key and press the fire button. The player will jump to collect the key. You will also use your fire button to move your player over the barrier on each level, as well as to help him jump over the torpedoes that constantly move in your path. If you miss, you are struck by a torpedo. It will not explode, but you'll be out of commission for several seconds before your player jumps up to resume gameplay. Once you've retrieved both keys on a level, the elevator doors will open, allowing you to enter the elevator. Be sure to go all the way to the end wall to have your player touch it. The elevator will rise to the next level. This process must be repeated for each level until your final escape. Okay, fair enough. Now let's try the game. Play session. I have a complete in-box copy of Airlock for some reason, so I set up my Atari 2600 Plus to try it. Here is that play session, slightly edited for content. This was supposed to be a fun little session, but it turned out more like an episode of AVGN than I hoped. All apologies to the nerd. Okay, so I've got this CIB copy of Airlock right here, and um, I'm gonna play it on my Atari 2600 Plus, and let's see how that goes. Jump. Reset. What the Get up! Get up. You only got like three seconds. Okay, try again. Come on. You Come on! Get up, get up, get up so we can try to get to the Over this Okay, how, where, where do we do, what do we do? Come on, come on, come on, come on, okay, over, ah! Get up, get up, get up! We got two seconds again, get up, get up, get Okay, 
Okay, you little <laughs> get this going this time. Besides sheer anger, here are my thoughts on airlock. First off, the instructions are wrong. The keys are not orange and white, they're orange and red. The Atari 2600 can show two player graphics and two missile graphics per line, and the player and missile are always the same color by default. Obviously, they use the missile graphic associated for the player for the first key and the one associated with the torpedo for the second key. They must have decided to change the color of the torpedoes at the last minute, and the key changed with it. And then they said, oh, what the hell, the manual's already printed, or more likely, they didn't even notice. This would not be a big deal, but there are only four objects in the entire game. Anyway, there isn't much of a game here. You start at the bottom of the screen and must collect the keys on each platform before the air runs out. But the graphics are terrible. And by terrible, I don't mean by NES or PlayStation 4 standards. I mean by Pong standards. By this time, the 2600 had been out for five years, and some of the better titles were being made. The sounds. Oh, the sounds, they are sparse and barely adequate. And that little tune that plays when you die, I think it will haunt my dreams. Other data age games. So this game is really bad, but it makes me wonder about the other Data Age games from the first set of releases from 1982. There are five games listed in the catalog at this time. Let's try them all. First, Bugs. Bugs is the paddle game that is like Centipede with all the fun removed. It's more enjoyable than Airlock, I think, but that's like saying, please cut off my ring finger instead of my thumb because at least I'll be able to hold things when you're done. It is some nice graphics though. Warplock, a paddle-based shooter that has gameplay a bit better than bugs, so let's say it's like having your pinky cut off. Snake seems to be an interestingly designed game that probably should not have been attempted on the 2600. It uses the joystick, thank God. You can only move your gun around the outermost walls. It's interesting, but also hard as hell, but it actually shows some promise. Encounter at L5, another paddle game, but this one's pretty good. Nice graphics, interesting premise, the scaling ships are fun to shoot, and the paddle controls work nicely. Honestly, they should have only released this game and maybe Snake if they were able to refine it more. Other data age grifts. In the package for Airlock, there's a card for a video game club. This is what it says. If you're ready for a new world of video game excitement, welcome to the club. Your membership in this exclusive club will tie you to some special features not offered by any other video game club. Contests, prizes, new game preview news, insider playing tips, updates on the nation's top scores, plus a special game design competition that could turn your winning concept into a best-selling video game cartridge, and much, much more. If you've watched our video about the 10 worst products for classic gamers, you will know just how much we hate video game clubs. Video games clubs were a total grift left over from the days of comic books designed to make kids feel special by taking all of their money and offering little in return. I do not know how this data age video game club worked, but judging by their games, it feels like it's simply a grift. Data Age also created a 7-inch single with music inspired by their games named Mindscape. The September 26, 1982 issue of Arcade Express had a news item about it. Data Age gives free record. In a unique marketing move, Data Age will provide distributors and retailers with free records to pass out to customers on September 17, 1982. On that date, the 3.5-minute stereo disc will be given away to dealers to promote the Data Age product line. Data Age has five video games, Snake, Warplock, Airlock, Bug, Bugs and encountered L5. Elements of each game are contained on the record produced by Craig Hunley, creator of special electronics music for films such as Star Trek the Movie, The Black Hole, Firefox, and others. The disc called Mindscape is said to blend the imagery and action of Data Age first five video games. And then their ad says, if you survive the audio adventure, you may be good enough to play our games. Here are the world of adventure in all five new Data Age video games on this sound sheet and discover a whole new kind of video game excitement. The audio journey challenge you with Snake, a jungle encounter with prehistoric predators, Warp Lock, a game that traps you in a bizarre space-time warp, Airlock, an underwater test of stamina where you race against time to free yourself and your crew from a disabled submarine, Bugs, a fight to the finish with a race of intelligent superbugs, and Encountered L5, where your battle orders take you beyond the 
the orbit of the moon to save a doomed space colony from destruction. Ask for data age wherever video games are sold and discover a whole new world of excitement. In some ways, I kind of dig this idea, but since the first set of games highlighted by this record were mostly awful, I feel like it was just another weird grift, with the company not highlighting their games, but masking them behind a slick marketing campaign. Just so you know, playing behind and now a little bit louder is a bit of the music from that Data Age record. I'd say, but instead of wasting their effort on a record, Data Age should have spent more time with their games. Reception. I found a couple contemporary reviews of Airlock. The first from Arcade Express surprised me. It does not appear to be discerning in any way, almost like they were giving the game a pass. It says this, The science fiction themed climbing contest is a solid cartridge from one of the newer independent producers of ECS compatible software. The player must get the keys to each airlock and jumping various oncoming obstacles reach the safety of the pressurized compartments that line the left and right edges of the playfield. The play mechanic is entertaining, though the graphics may be a little rough by VCS standards rating 8 8 no way arcade express is from the same people who made electronic games this review makes me question everything i loved about electronic games and 8 what were they thinking? A more realistic review of the game appeared in the December 1982 issue of Electronic Fun, where they give the game a single joystick out of five, saying, The fact you can beat Airlock isn't enough to save you from a fate similar to that which befalls the on-screen protagonist, Drowning. He at least has the short-lived satisfaction of knowing he's going down with the ship, or in this case, the submarine. You only get to drown in boredom. Okay, that's just an awesome review. Data Age Crash we can chart the success of Data Age by looking at the prices of Data Age games from 1982 to 1984. Here's an ad from November 17, 1982, with Data Age games priced at $14 each. Here's an ad from December 19, 1982, with Data Age games priced for $12.99 each. Here's an ad from November 2, 1983, with Data Age games priced at $4.97 each. And here's an ad from March 25, 1984, with Data Age games priced at $3.88. And I'm sure it got lower and lower and lower from there, too. From the May 8, 1984 edition of Arcade Express, Data Age files Chapter 11. Unable to dispel a retailer a new eye generated by its initial group of releases, the ones we we're talking about, Data Age has filed for Chapter 11. The publisher made its entry with a lineup of five cartridges for the Atari 2600 during the 1983 gift giving season. Actually, it was 1982. Although Encounter at L5 and to a lesser extent Airlock, wrong, drew some praise from electronic gaming critics, overall reaction to the program, such as Bugs and Snake, was lukewarm. So Data Age games such as Airlock were some of the first to price crash in 1983. They helped drive inventory up and profits down through 1984. In an article named The Great Shakeout from the March 1984 issue of Electronic Games, they specifically called out Data Age as being the worst of the worst and the reason for the shakeout. A case in point, some analysts say, is Data Age. The product, when it finally reached consumers, was not state-of-the-art. Two years previous, yes, but not when introduced. The Data Age cartridges with their clumsy graphics soon got lost in the shuffle. In fact, even if games from Atari like E.T. and Pac-Man contributed to the North American video game crash, they were also big sellers. It was absolute dogs from companies like Data Age, ones that filled shelves and never moved, that were the real culprits. I mean, even though their disappointments, Pac-Man and E.T. were at least playable. Airlock, Warplock, and Bugs are on a totally different level. Not only are they ugly and awful, they actually spawn anger from players. They're cynical and terrible. Forty years later, if you want a new, actual, real poster child for the North American video game crash, you should look no further than Data Age and Airlock. Final thoughts. I can see that there's an idea for a game in Airlock, but it's the kind of game where you must do everything almost exactly right to continue. The margin for error is not just razor thin, it doesn't even exist. The game is more like a puzzle, a frustrating, ugly, annoying puzzle. The graphics are hilariously bad, but even then, bad graphics don't necessarily make for a bad game. See Atari Adventure. In a better game, this could be considered fun, or at least a challenge, but here it barely even qualifies for a game. Let's look at Chris Crawford's definition of game versus puzzle from his book, The Art of Computer Game Design. He says this. One way to understand the interactive element of games is to contrast games with puzzles and other non-interactive challenges. Compare playing a cube puzzle with playing a game of tic-tac-toe. The key difference that makes one activity a game and the other an activity not a game is one 
of interactive. A cube puzzle does not actively respond to a person's moves. By this definition, airlock is not a game. It's a puzzle. It does not react to the player in any way. It just puts obstacles in the way that you need to get over and a time limit that's insane. The things are just there and they need to be conquered in a very specific order to win. In reality, you can see, hear, smell, feel and taste the North American video game crash as you play Airlock. Look, yes, this game is worse than E.T. Far, far worse. It's also worse than Tax Avoiders. It's far, far, far worse than Bobby's Going Home. At least Tax Avoiders had a premise that can be navigated. This game is just impossible to play. Joystick throwing, CRT breaking, difficult. It's also bad. It's, I spent 377 at KB Toys and I wish I'd spent that money on a Misfits of Science action figure instead bad. Therefore, it can't exist on the same plane as Tax Avoiders. So we need to create a new lane, which I will call Worser. And I'd be remiss not to add bugs and warp lock to the Worser row too, because they definitely are. All three of these games scream tech demo to me. They are fine little tests on how a game might be made, but none of them should have ever seen the light of day. Data Age should have filed them away and released Encountered L5 only, and maybe Snake. As for Snake, it's about as good as Tax Avoiders, but still worse than ET, while Encountered L5 is probably as good as ET. I'd like to play that one a bit more now. And there it goes. The first five releases by Data Age, four of which are worse than ET. Since Data Age led the pack for Chapter 11 in 1984, their inventory was some of the first to end up in the famous bargain bins. I'd say we are now zeroing in on the worst game ever for the Atari 2600. We might have already found it. We definitely found one of the main causes of the North American video game crash. Cynical companies with cynical releases that should have never been on the shelf in the first place. But really, that's not fair either. The reasons for the great shakeout, better known as the North American video game crash, were complicated, with faults lying in every aspect of the business, from manufacturing to shipping to marketing to inventory and return policies, and yes, to the games themselves. If you want to find out more about the crash, I suggest you seek out the podcast, They Create Worlds. Those guys have researched and covered it in great and amazing detail. Oh my god, that was a harrowing experience. My next goal is to see if there are any games worse than Airlock, Warplock, and Bugs. I may need some help. If you got all the way through this, please leave us a message to tell us what game you think is the absolute worst for the Atari 2600, and then I'll see if I have the stomach to play them. We were children of the Silicon Revolution, an X generation conscripted to fight the console and home computer wars. A product of an analog 70s childhood became of digital age in the 80s, believing we could affect the world eight bits at a time. Armed with joysticks, full stroke keyboards, jolt cola, and MTV haircuts, we proceeded into the vertical blank. There, we stayed up late at night, devising incantations from D&D rulebooks and beginners' all-purpose symbolic instruction code. Video games were the match, and programming was suffused as the infinite possibilities of the digital world exploded into the internet age to come. We are Generation Atari. Into the vertical blank.